thank you so much, and thank you all of you for being here. This is the morning it has been incredible so far, and um, I hope we can continue this in, in an incredible experience of being here and sharing what we know. Today, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, the Whale Sanctuary Project. Uh, and just want to say that there are many, many people in this room who are on our team, including Charles Vinnick, our executive director, Jeff Foster, uh, Naomi Rose, and Ingrid Visser, and many others. And uh, of course, you know, Jeff Ventry, and, and on and on and on. And just want to say, you know, thank you to them for uh, creating a real dream team. Uh, to, to make this happen. So let's, let's talk about what's going on. So obviously, you know, this is really, you know, the, the anniversary of Blackfish. And as Kim mentioned, the Will Sanctuary Project comes right out of the Blackfish Effect. It is a product of the Blackfish Effect in many ways. So before we get into the sanctuary itself, let's talk about, you know, cetacean captivity by the numbers. <laughs> How many of these animals are actually sitting in concrete tanks or in small sea pens around the world? Well, we estimate there's around 3,000 of them, uh, representing about 10 different species and some hybrids. Uh, and they're held all around the world. The, in North America, there are over 481 bottlenose dolphins, 80 belugas, well, uh, yeah, we have to say 88 belugas now, because Marine Land uh, has 58 now, um, and my understanding is there are more on the way. Um, 24 orcas and many other species. Uh, there are currently 60 orcas held in captivity around the world, a mixture of wild caught and captive born. That's a very proximate number because we really don't know what's going on over in Russia and in China and other parts of the world in terms of the, the captures. Uh, and, but we do know that here in this country, SeaWorld holds 22 orcas. And it is worth noting that uh, at least 91% of all orcas taken into captivity since we started doing this have died. So I want to go from the numbers to some of the actual lives or the quality. Let's see if we could. Yeah, the quality of the lives of some of these, the individuals who are either sitting in the tanks or were sitting in the tanks and just sort of honor who they are because they're not a number, they're unique individuals who have suffered because of the captivity industry. This is Kiska. She is sitting all alone at Marine Land. She's been alone for six years and she has seen all five of her children die in the tanks. And she, ironically, is right next door to the 58 belugas stuffed into the two tanks that are adjoining her tank. There they are, there's some of them, the belugas at Marine Lands. 50 plus, at least 58, there will be more by the end of next week. And here they are, and you know, what's notable about this is, is the fact that here's the public, they're feeding them, they're putting their hands on them, uh, you know, they're touching them. Uh, this is an extremely invasive uh, activity and the possibilities for, you know, deep disease transmission uh, are just, you know, off the charts here. And of course, I don't have to tell you, we all know about the plight of Tokate, also known as Lolita.
and Morgan. You will hear a lot more about that from Ingrid Visser, who has championed Morgan's uh, uh, plight. Uh, here's Morgan after a show. Morgan is now pregnant and still in Laurel Parkey. So that's just a few of the many individuals who suffer because they are living in concrete tanks. Let's get into a little bit more of what actually happens to these animals when they are forced to live in the concrete tanks. Um, this is, this is a, a story about chronic stress. It's a story about immune system dysfunction. It's a story of death. Some of the things that we see in many of these animals are infectious disease, all kinds, you know, meningitis, encephalitis, pneumonia, uh, all kinds of infectious diseases um, that are due to the fact that their, their immune systems are, are shot, basically. Um, candidiasis, a fungal infection, we see in orcas in the tanks, no record of it in the wild and many forms of gastric ulcers and other disorders. We see behavioral problems, stereotypies. These are the same kinds of things you see in emotionally disturbed humans and other animals, uh, <coughs> repetitive behaviors. One of those be repetitive behaviors is grating the teeth on hard surfaces. You're gonna hear a lot more about that from Jeff Ventry um, in his, in his uh, talk, but you can see those were Tilikum's teeth, what was left of them. Um, and it is a form of self-mutilation, and also there's nowhere to go, so they're under very poor muscular condition. You heard from Charles how you have to recondition them uh, because they really don't get any exercise in the tanks. We also see lots of hyperaggression between whales, for instance. This is the, the tragic incident of Kandu uh, colliding with Corky uh, in the tank, and Kandu bled out in front of the audience and in front of her child. Um, lots of depression going off feed and things of that nature, and poor or absent parenting because they don't have the opportunity to learn how to be a parent um, in, in the tanks. So here are some more individuals, and we all know the case of Kasaka, who is euthanized at the age of 40 uh, at SeaWorld. Um, and you can see that she had some kind of a very, very bad skin condition, and we don't, we still don't know. We do still don't have an answer as to what <coughs> actually was going on there. The alarming thing is that we see this in other whales as well. This is Malia. She's an 11-year-old at SeaWorld Orlando. And if you look at the white parts of her rostrum, you can see she's got <coughs> some kind of a skin condition as well. There's a discoloration. This was taken two days ago. Um, and she's getting worse, and no one really knows what she's suffering from, but it's very alarming given the path that Kasaka went down. SeaWorld tried to say it was diatoms. Diatoms? Well, they said on like their Facebook or something, like Malia is experiencing a skin condition similar to wild orcas when they travel through cold water. Um, okay. <laughs> Which I assume means diatoms. Yeah, diatoms. I don't think there is even a comment necessary on that. <laughs> um, this is Maris. Maris is not with us any longer. She's near and dear to my heart. Um, she's a beluga who is at the Georgia Aquarium. She died at the age of 21 after losing two of her children uh, at the Georgia Aquarium. Um, and uh, we are trying to find out what happened to Maris um, because we still don't know what killed her. The official 
A description from the veterinarian, Greg Bossart, at the Georgia Aquarium was, this was a case of acute animal death. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she died of heart failure. She was alive on a Tuesday, eating and active, and on Wednesday, she was dead. So, yeah, it's a cute animal death, but, you know, what caused that? And Maris is not unusual in the beluga world. I mean, the belugas are like that. This is how, this is what happens to them in the tanks. One day they're there, the next day they're not. And this is little Aaliyah, a little 10-year-old bottomless dolphin who died recently at Dolphinarius. This is the second or the first one of two dolphins to die in the desert uh, at Dolphinarius in the past couple of months. Bodie was the first one who died there. Yeah. I'm from Arizona. Yeah, in Arizona. So. Here's the question. How do we end this for good? How do we get to the point where these kinds of things are not happening anymore? Well, I have to go back. Maybe that is, maybe that is what I wanted to say. Okay. <laughs> the answer, the answer seems to be sanctuary. And the answer is to provide something that doesn't exist for animals like these anymore um, or yet. There are sanctuaries for all kinds of land animals. We've seen them, elephants, primates. There are none yet, none yet for dolphins and whales. But that's about to change. One of the taglines for the Whale Sanctuary Project is back to nature. And back to nature means a couple of things and at two different levels, two very different levels. One is the road back to nature for individual whales who are suffering in the concrete tanks into a more natural environment. From exploitation and abuse and a path to restitution and restoration an instantiation of that was what was done with Keiko. It's what Michael talked about. This is what it's about, giving back what we've taken from them. But the road back to nature is also a social movement. And it's about how we perceive other animals. So, it's not just about a few whales that get to live in a more natural environment, in a sanctuary. It's about changing our perceptions of them from objects, commodities, and resources to individuals deserving of respect and possessing inherent rights to live their life. So let me tell you a little bit about the Whale Sanctuary Project. Our mission is to establish a permanent seaside sanctuary where captive cetaceans can live in an environment that optimizes their well-being and autonomy and is as close as possible to their natural habitat. And a lot of places call themselves sanctuaries, but there are some very specific features of authentic sanctuaries that you need to look out for. Just because a place has a bunch of wild animals doesn't mean it's a sanctuary. They can call themselves a sanctuary, but 
uh, there are things that you can look for that will allow you to distinguish sanctuaries from zoos and entertainment parks. First of all, an authentic sanctuary is a place to give an opportunity to thrive. Thrive. Not just survive, but actually have an opportunity to live a life worth living. And it is also a model of change in our culture, right? So when the sanctuary goes up, it's not just going to be a place where we are going to provide an opportunity for a few whales to live a better life. It is going to be an instantiation on the ground of a new relationship with these animals. One, as I said, that's not exploitive, respective, respectful of their inherent rights. So, what is an authentic sanctuary? It's a place where whale well-being is the priority. Nothing else comes before that, period, full stop. Individualized <laughs> lifetime care, because the sanctuary will be a permanent place. No exploitation, no breeding, and definitely no unnecessary invasive procedures. There will be a promotion of choice and autonomy with the overall goal of restoration. Now it's still going to be captivity and these animals are going to come into the sanctuary with a lot of emotional baggage and so forth. But it's our job to work with that to create or restore as much of the life that animal should have had as we can. So a lot of people say, well, you know, let's just get them out of the tanks and dump them back in the ocean. Don't they know how to survive? They're smart. Um, well, no, um, they don't. Captive-born whales do not have survival skills. You saw what it took to get Keiko to the point that they got him to. In the tanks, they don't know how to survive in the wild. They don't know what a fish is, and they don't have a social group, a free-ranging social group to integrate into, and that is critically important for a social animal like an orca or a dolphin or a beluga whale. For the few that were captured in the wild when they were babies, They've been in the tanks for decades. And there is a question about whether or not they would be able to survive. <laughs> One thing I will tell you is our mantra at the Whale Sanctuary Project is the following, that all decisions that we make are going to be based upon evidence. It's going to be based upon the best scientific practices. Not what we want, what so-and-so wants, but consulting the best information we have to make the best decision for each individual whale. Our residents will be orcas and or beluga whales. And uh, we chose these two species to focus on because they do the worst in the concrete tanks. So they really need to get out. And it's important for us to acknowledge that we're not alone. We're part of a worldwide movement. Naomi talked about this, the fact that there are a number of efforts like this coming online around the world. This is sanctuary, is the word of the day. Here are two. One is the National Aquarium Dolphin Sanctuary on the left, and you can see their concept drawing. They are building a sanctuary down in Florida or the Bahamas for seven bottlenose dolphins that they currently have at the aquarium in Baltimore. Uh, that's gonna be coming online soon. There's another one. 
Uh, sea Life Trust, in partnership with WDC, are building a beluga whale sanctuary for two belugas who are coming from Asia and are being prepared. Um, and, and it's in the same cove that Charles talked about. These are two that are going to be happening in the next couple of years, but there are many others that are in different phases as well. So we are part of a sanctuary movement. And here's what the Whale Sanctuary Project Sanctuary is going to look like. This is a concept drawing. It's not a particular place, but it shows all of the elements that are important for an authentic sanctuary for orcas or beluga whales. Um, the expanse of water, the, the security of the, the double nets that, that keep the animals in the facility, the ability for people to come and visit and see the animals, but from a distance, in a totally non-invasive way, where we can do a education about who these animals are and why they need to be in the ocean. And you can see off in the distance there, our house, um, which would be a full service veterinary facility, top notch. And that would allow us to care for these animals for the rest of their lives, some of them like 20, 30, 40 years. And as I'll talk about in a minute, also be a full service rescue and rehab facility for free ranging animals. So let me say a little bit about sort of unpack this. What are some of the things that we want to do as part of the Whale Sanctuary Project? Well, one of them is to make a positive contribution to conservation. Conservation of any of the cetaceans in any of the areas that we end up citing the sanctuary. Um, and that includes not just educating people about things they could do to help, but also to be on the ground as a real rescue and rehab facility. And we all know that when populations of whales and dolphins become endangered, every individual counts. And we need to have a place where somebody can help individuals who are in trouble before it gets to the point of no return. And we will be able to do that. We will also be a place where we can, again, do public education and outreach. We'll have an interpretive center somewhere, may not be right on site, it might be somewhere else, but a place where people can really immerse themselves in real authentic education, not the stuff you get at SeaWorld or some of these other places, but actual scientific information about these animals. As I mentioned, they could come and visit, um, see the animals through scopes. Um, we will foster uh, and sponsor internship programs for pre-vet, um, remote webcam experiences. We can basically show what the resident whales are doing to anybody who has a computer anywhere in the world. So, and that includes folks at SeaWorld and so forth. So we can take this experience and just put it out there globally. And lots of community outreach. So again, this is something that we want to be an integral part of whatever community uh, decides to embrace us. It's not something we're imposing on anyone. It's something that we're offering as a positive thing. Um, to whatever community decides that this is for them. So let me tell you a little bit about site selection because we've been steeped in that for the past couple of years. As you know, we have been looking uh, in three general areas, uh, Nova Scotia, British Columbia, and Washington State. 
And I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the how involved the process of site selection is. Because it's not, you know, you just don't go there and say, oh, that looks good, and you put a flag in there and say, okay, there's going to be a sanctuary here. Not at all. It is so complex. It is more complex than I even imagined starting off. Um, and there's a lot involved, and it's long term. Let me give you an idea of some of the phases that we have to go through to come to the point where we might be able to get to the point where we're asking for permitting for a particular site. You know, first thing is, of course, identifying sites that have the physical and environmental characteristics that would support a sanctuary, and I'll talk about those in a moment. But also beginning to partner with local communities and learning what it would be like to create a, san a permanent sanctuary in this place or that place and asking people to work with us to, d to create something that doesn't exist yet, but something that's in harmony and with their local community. So local communities, very important because it is going to be part of a community. It's not going to be imposed on a community. There's all kinds of preliminary meetings one has to have with local and regional government agencies and other stakeholders. So we've been meeting with people on, on all fronts at many different sites. And this is extremely important to get input from stakeholders. How are we going to impact what you do for a living, where you live, and so forth? We want to know, we want to talk to you, we want to work with you to work it out. And this is all ongoing and precedes really any formal applications for permitting to local, regional, and federal government agencies. Um, so there is a lot of on the ground homework that needs to be done before we get to the point where we could say, okay, let's, let's apply for a permit for the site from the US or the Canadian government, and then there's different levels to that. So our site criteria are generally um, an area of about 100 acres, minimum 65 acres, protection from extreme weather, avoidance of sewage or pollutants, good flushing through, through the water space, um, a minimum depth of 15 meters over about half of the facility, uh, the ability to create separate compartments for medical and management purposes, very important because you know, we were going to have to have a quarantine area. We're going to have to separate animals who don't get along. And we may need a, a separate area for uh, rehabilitation of free-ranging animals. So we have to have the topography to create that, those kinds of separations. And of course, you know, not a lot of human activity or boat traffic around the area. So I wanted to talk about this because I think it's extremely important. Um, and wherever we go, our priority is to do diligence in terms of ecological responsibility. And of course, that really comes to the fore when you are considering any region that might contain critical habitat uh, for an endangered population. Um, and so what we've done to address this issue, which is ongoing anywhere we go, we want to make sure that we do diligence, is We've established a panel of leading marine mammal experts, scientists and veterinarians, who can help guide us through the process of assessing the potential impacts and risks of a sanctuary on a particular site. And 
The goal is to obviously select a site where those impacts and risks can be effectively mitigated. Okay. So with all that said, let me give you some idea of our progress so far in three areas. Down selecting sites, meaning narrowing down certain sites, a site list, our ecological risk assessment, assessment and community and stakeholder outreach. Okay, so let's talk about down selecting sites. This is again a long process. Now we just began in 2016, we became a nonprofit organization. Um, and the way we began the search is basically by reviewing hundreds of potential sites either pulled from navigation charts or on Google Maps. So desktop, just to, to find areas in those regions that had the proper environmental features or attributes. Um, and uh, we spent uh, many months doing that and eventually uh, decided on about 120 plus different sites that we should take to the next level of assessment. Still desktop analysis, but starting to look at depth charts, um, where it was in relation to industry, things of that nature. Um, and that continued on all through 2016 and 2017. Um, and we eventually got down to about 30 sites that we have visited on the ground. We have been on the ground or on the water, as it were. Um, 30 sites in Nova Scotia, Washington State, and British Columbia. And we are currently in evaluation of a number of sites of interest. <coughs> What have we done in terms of risk assessment, in terms of ecological responsibility? Well, as I mentioned to you, we created a panel, a blue ribbon panel of prominent leading experts in veterinary science and marine mammal science. And we asked them for their guidance on issues of things, risks like disease transmission back and forth from the resident whales to any free-ranging whales in the area. What do they think are the risks? Are there risks? And not only that, but are they mitigatable? What would you do to bring the risk down to negligible? We also asked them if they thought the sanctuary should be a place of rescue and rehab for free-ranging orcas or belugas, wherever we are. We ask them to recommend actions, and this is very specific to right here, because we're very, very sensitive to the status of the southern resident killer whales, and we want to make sure that if we are going to even consider a sanctuary in Washington State that, as I mentioned before, everything we do is based upon the best scientific evidence, the best available guidance from the experts. So what could we do if we were, say, in this region to help conserve the southern residents? And a generally informed opinion about whether it's a good idea or not to locate a sanctuary in critical habitat of an endangered population. We asked several people on this panel, and we were actually quite surprised to find that every single one of them supported the idea of a sanctuary and stated that the risks that might be there are minor and mitigatable with proper procedures and due diligence. 
So they basically said, we think this is an idea worth pursuing. They also said that a big plus would be if you guys were a rescue and rehab facility for the Southern residents. Um, that's something you don't have and you're gonna need in the future. And that any tiny risks associated with things like disease transmission or effects upon behavior are mitigatable. In addition to getting the opinion of the scientific community, we have been engaged in a lot of community and stakeholder outreach in all of the sites that we are interested in. We are talking to local residents. We are talking to local businesses and commercial interests, fishermen, recreational boaters. Everybody has to be consulted on this. First Nations, extremely important. In all three regions, we have had sit-down meetings, discussions with First Nations about how they feel about something like a sanctuary for whales in their homeland. We have connections with the academic and scientific community in all three regions, and consult with NGOs, community organization. It takes a whole village. I mean, this is the kind of thing, again, that um, we are looking for lots of input from local people as well as people who um, can provide uh, insight and scientific guidance. So we have been engaged in all of this for past year um, and uh, it's been incredibly, it's a lot of work, but it's incredibly rewarding as well. I wanna say a little bit and acknowledge uh, who's funding this because this is going to be a 15 to 20 million dollar project in terms of capital costs and about one to two million dollar a year maintenance uh, and we were very lucky to have uh, in the beginning in 2016 uh, due to a, a chance meeting uh, between Naomi Rose and Samantha Berg in California and the CEO of the Munchkin Company, Stephen Dunn. Um, Stephen uh, was very moved by the plight of Telecom and uh, decided that he wanted to help create the first sanctuary for captive orcas. And so he's pledged at least a million dollars to the creation of the sanctuary. And so, they, Munchkin is our founding donor. And uh, they, we really uh, are grateful for their leadership in this role. And you can see some of the things that they do on their website. They have all kinds of cute uh, t-shirts. A bathtub is not big enough for an orca. Project Orca is their project. Um, where they connect with what we're doing. And there's um, an event we were at, these are a couple of uh, volunteers uh, who were tabling at the Wildlife Expo in San Francisco just a, just a few months ago. And if you notice on the table there, there are these little, <laughs> these little baby rubber orcas. Well, the story behind that is that those were toys that Munchkin sold. And as soon as Stephen Dunn uh, decided that bathtubs were not big enough for orcas, he discontinued that product with his company. <laughs> and so he's got a box, a giant, like there's hundreds of them left. And they gave them to us. And now we, we bring them around everywhere. And um, you know, kids love them. You put them on the end of a pen or something. Um, and, and the point is, is that now these little rubber toys are really serving an incredible purpose. They are the point of connection with the public, with kids. Um, and we can tell a story when someone comes up and says, oh, look how cute, can I have one? 
we have the opportunity to tell them about what we're doing, what Munchkin is doing. And it, it's, so we've sort of repurposed these little orca toys, <laughs> and they're now working for us. So. <laughs> And if any of you has any, please tell us where they are. We're going to start a, we're in the world of the Munchkin Orcas yeah. campaign. <laughs> Truly. I guess what I want to say is that at this point, you know, two years into this endeavor, and this is a long haul, but it's going to happen. There are so many people in this room who have made that possible, who are our support base, who support not only with funding, but with just their comments and telling people about what we're doing. And we need to just continue. We need to continue and build and grow and make this thing happen. And we cannot do it alone. Just like in 2016, when I said, can we build a sanctuary? I didn't just go out there and say, oh, I can do it all on my own. <laughs> I mean, I gathered the best team in the world to do this. And so we need you guys to be the best team in the world to bring this to fruition. And I want to give a special shout out to one of our really major donors, Jan Pettifor, who unfortunately isn't here today, um, but Jan has been a, a real, real major supporter. She's been able to do that. And uh, there she is with my boyfriend, Rupert. <laughs> um, and, uh, and on the right is the uh, Orca Mobile, one of many that she has. And just, you know, thank you, Jan, and thank you, all of you. So what's happening in the next few months? Well, we are currently spending a lot of time on so stakeholder engagement, looking into regulatory process assessments because you just don't get a permit for something, you've got to do tests to make sure everything's in line. And community outreach and consultation. And I say consultation because it's not about going to a local community and trying to convince them that this is the best thing for them. This is about saying to them, what do you think? How would this work for you? How would this actually be a plus for you? We want to hear so that you can help us or we could all work together to build this thing. In the fall and the winter, we're going to hopefully start to formalize some of the site acquisitions. Uh, we're going to be doing some environmental impact assessments and studies, ongoing community consultation, and we're going to begin our initial capital campaign. That's where we're going to need everybody. And next year, we hope to begin the formal permitting process where we've done all the homework and we go to the government agencies and say, this is what we want to do here. And we begin that process. We begin the process of site design, which is very exciting. Ongoing community engagement, ongoing fundraising, and yes, we plan for the first residence by the end of 2020. Yeah. So that's a little bit of the inside scoop on what our team has been doing for the past two years. And again, I just want to thank you for all your continued support. Please tell people about us, go to our website and also go on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the whole gamut, and you'll see lots of fun stuff. Um, just want to mention that uh, one of the organizations that's been really doing a lot to, to help us 
tell the story in social media is Oceanic Preservation Society and Louis right here. So we thank them and all the other uh, organizations who have reached out to us to say we're joining with you to create this sanctuary once and for all. So thank you.